having everyone. Welcome to First United Methodist Church. It's great to see you today. And if you haven't looked at the front of your bulletin yet, I want to remind you that our, our word today is love and our memory verse is love one another. And we will have lots of opportunities to do that. This is going to be an exciting service for our children, our youth, and our adults. Uh, we have the sacrament of baptism today, and so we welcome the Ojibwe family and are grateful for all of you being here, and grateful for all of you being here today. And um, we are beginning 2018 with a new system of you letting us know that you've been here. We have large attendance folders that are going to be passed out to you at the beginning of the time when our children come forward for Faith Like a Child. You'll notice that you can sign in either as a, a guest, visitor, new to our community, or as a member. We encourage everyone to do that because we will lift up your names in prayer during the week in our chapel, and it will give us a way to follow up with you. Once you've signed in, please pass it down to the end of your row and then when it gets to the end of your row, please pass it back. And when it comes back, be proactive. Please take a moment to see who is worshiping with you. And if you can remember even one person's first name and say it to them when we pass the peace, that's going to make an incredible difference on somebody's day. So thank you so much for doing that. If you would like to become a member of our church today, I'll be giving you an invitation at the end of the service, and you can prepare by finding the How to Join card and filling that out during the service. Dr. Bill Longsworth is here, and oh, does he have an announcement. Next Sunday, our sanctuary services will have a real treat. Uh, men of First Methodist Church will be singing. The first time I heard them, uh, their Rise Up, O Men of God, was so unbelievable that it knocked me out of my pew, and I had a concussion. <laughs> At that point, while I was having a concussion, I think I decided I wanted to sing with them the next time that it was available. Now, R Robert, uh, you don't listen to this, but um, I can't read music. I, I can sort of see, well, the notes going up and the notes going down. But I have a memory, so I sit next to a really good bass in the rehearsals, and uh, after two rehearsals, I've got it down, and I can nail most of it on Sunday morning. And Robert's very kind. He's never mentioned the times so I haven't nailed it. And <clears throat> but it's not just our performance here in the sanctuary. For me, one of the most wonderful things is the rehearsals. To be in that choir room with wooden floors and plaster walls, the harmonies are unbelievably beautiful. So there are young fathers here, middle-aged fathers and grandfathers. I invite each and every one of you to come up to the choir room on the second floor this Wednesday. You're probably good enough. You only need one rehearsal. I need two. The music that you will experience in that rehearsal will definitely feed your soul. Bill, thank you so much. I do hope all the men will come join us Wednesday and Sunday. It will be a lot of fun. And now let us prepare ourselves for worship through the leadership of Choral Union. Would you please stand for the call to worship? Jesus offers a new commandment that we should, with the incredible power and depth of God's love for us, we can, we must, and it is in this, our love for one another, that the world will know who we truly worship. Come, children of God, let us.
I invite you now to turn back to your bulletin so that we can affirm our faith together. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God, who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make you, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our own, in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. This time in our service is a very sacred and holy time as we come to infant baptism. And at this morning, I invite the parents of uh, Charles and Emma to please come forward. Brothers and sisters in Christ, baptism is a sacrament. It's a means of grace indicating that we do not come into the relationship on the basis of anything that we've done or anything that we've accomplished, but simply on the basis of God's gracious invitation of love to us. Infant baptism is an especially appropriate demonstration of this grace. As we remember the words that Jesus said, let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such as these belongs the kingdom of God. Do you affirm your faith in Christ? And do you promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, all nations, and all races? And will you nurture these children in Christ's holy church, that by your teaching and example they may be guided to accept God's grace for themselves, to profess their faith openly, and to lead a Christian life? All right. Let's take Charlie. Hi. Charles Boyce, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now if you'll place your hands on him also. Charles Boyce, the Holy Spirit work within you, that being born of water and the Spirit, you'll remain a faithful disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Emma Jane Kyle, I baptize you in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Place your hands on her also. Emma Jane Kyle, the Holy Spirit work within you, that being born of water and the Spirit, you will remain a faithful disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, let me take Charlie. Go for a little walk. 
What a blessing it is to participate in this wonderful sacrament of baptism as we pledge ourselves along with their parents that we will do all that we can uh, to live a life of, you know, she, he doesn't look real comfortable. Let me get situated here. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> to, to live a life that Christ calls us to in front of them and also to do everything we can to help them know the love and the grace uh, of God in Christ. And this is God's wonderful gift offered to us without price. I invite, you, I invite you now as your church family to turn into your bulletin as we make our pledge to support these children and this family. With, With God's, God's help, help, we, we will, will so order, order our, our lives after the example of Christ, Christ that, that Charles Boyce and Emma Jane Kyle being born of established in the faith and confirmed and strengthened in the way that leads to life eternal. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 43 through 48. You have heard that it was said, you must love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who harass you, so that you will be acting as children of your Father who is in heaven. He makes the sun rise on both the evil and the good and sends rain on both the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love only those who love you, 
what reward do you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing? Don't even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, just as your heavenly Father is complete in showing love to everyone, so also must you be complete. God speaks to us through the reading of Scripture. I'd like to invite the children down for our Faith Like a Child time. And as they come down, grown-ups, don't forget, here come the attendance pads. Make sure to fill those out. Kids, come on. Good morning, friends. So I have with me my friend Will. Everybody say hi to Will. And Will is going to be helping me today. So we're talking about love. Say love. And you know, Mr. Rogers, the great Mr. Rogers, the ordained Presbyterian minister, Mr. Rogers, would remind us that there are many ways to say I love you. Like we could say it in sign language. Will you want to show them in sign language? I love you you. Let's all do that together. I love you. So there's the signing way. There's even the singing way we can go. I love you. I I don't know. Well, I think they need more inspiration. Get your opera costume inspiration. Yeah, that'll do it. Now, I love you. you. Oh, bravissimo. That was fantastic. There's even the robot way to say I love you. Show them, Will. I love you. Oh, that was good. Let's try that. Here we go. I love you. Domo arigato. That was fantastic. And, you know, while robots are just learning to love, you've been learning to love your entire lives through things that you do and people you're around and your experiences. Even today, we've seen people saying, I love you in special ways, like the acolytes bringing in the light of Christ and the cross, or uh, Lila so gently putting that flower. Do you know what that flower is for? That flower is to, to, to help us remember someone in, in our family, in our church family who has died. And Lila so sweetly puts that flower there. And then when there's a birth, when there's a new baby, an older adult comes and brings a red carnation and puts it on there. And that's a way that we can say, I love you. So we're going to play a game. You like games? Oh, good. Here's how this game works. And grown-ups, you're going to play too. I'm going to call out like a different kind of scenario as a way of showing love. And if you think that that's something you could do as a way of saying, I love you, I want you to make the sign for love. Will, you want to show them the sign for love again? Show the grown-ups. That's the sign for love. Okay, so here we go drawing a special picture for your teacher. If you can do that, make the sign for love. Of course you can. We can all do that. Writing a thank you note for a custodian and leaving it in the pew for them to find. Who can do that? Mm -hmm. And y'all have got stuff in your backpacks to do that today, I bet. Calling a relative just to say hi. Sure, that's a way of saying I love you. Cleaning your room without being asked. Uh Uh-huh. Asking your parents how their day went. Raising money to help people you might never meet. Yeah, that's a way all of us can say I love you. Asking your mom what you can do to help. Mm -hmm. Telling your dad that his jokes just keep getting funnier and funnier, (laughs) even though you've heard them all a million times. And honestly, they are funnier every time, right? right? We love it when you tell us that. Praying for someone else. We can all pray for someone else. That's a way of saying I love you. Having a conversation with someone and mostly listening. It's a great way to say I love you. And then when all else fails, simply looking someone right in the eye and saying 
I love you. We are never, ever, ever going to say that enough times in this world. This world needs more love, and we're just the people to start filling this world with more love. It starts by showing love and saying love. And you know who else likes to hear I love you? God does. So let's have a prayer. Repeat after me. Dear God, God, thank you you. for all the people we love, all the people who love us, all the people we've never even met. We love you. We love them. And we know you love us. Amen. Bye, friend. Well, the mobility of our children gives us the model for how we should pass the peace to one another. This is not a time to just stay in your little space. This is a time to enthusiastically stand, to move around, to turn to others, and offer them the peace of Christ. Would you please do that?
thankful to be in worship on this first Sunday of the new year and also the first Sunday in the season of Epiphany. The word Epiphany, of course, means a revealing or a revelation. And it is the season when we focus on the revelation of the nature and the will of God that we have in Jesus. And, and so we're paying attention to Jesus in a particular way in this season of Epiphany. When I was a child, we had a family Bible, and that family Bible was a red letter edition. How many of you know what that means? Just about everybody, red letter edition. I remember that title page uh, in the Bible said, the words of Christ in red. And so all of Jesus' words uh, were uh, printed in red in that edition. And even at a very early age, I understood that there's something special, there's something important, there's a reason those are in red. And so in this series, Red Letter Christians, we are paying attention to what Jesus said. It's also, of course, the beginning of a new year, and, and there's always that special time. I mean, it's in some ways, it's no different than last week. But in other ways, it's very different. You open a new calendar, and there's something inviting about the blank pages of a new calendar that says, make some new commitments, do something different. You can do better, you can be better, and it leads us to make those resolutions. And so it's appropriate that we focus on the red letters uh, in this series at the beginning of, of the year. So we're going to start the new year in a way that I know that you will find exciting. We're going to have a test. How's that? What? Not much enthusiasm in the room for that. But uh, here's the way it's going to work. You're going to vote, if you will. Nobody's going to count the votes or no grades given. But I'm going to read some quotes. Now, if this is a quote from Jesus, then hold up the red side of your bulletin. If it's not, then hold up the other side, the back side of the bulletin. Okay? Here we go. <clears throat> God helps those who help themselves. Yeah? All right. Actually, it's, it's been repeated over and over again, really through the centuries, but it was made famous by Benjamin Franklin in Poor Richard's Almanac of 1757. Here's another one. A fool thinks himself to be wise, but a wise man knows himself to be a fool. What do you think? Mm, Jesus got a lot of votes on that one. That was actually Billy Shakespeare, William Shakespeare. <laughs> <clears throat> For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Yeah, Jesus got a lot of That's Jesus, yes. Mark uh, 8, 36. God works in mysterious ways. Mm -hmm. Well, it's actually William Cowper who wrote that in a hymn. It's, it's similar. His hymn actually said, written in the 19th century, that God moves in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. But it gets quoted as God works in mysterious ways. Pride goeth before a fall little tricky. It's not Jesus. It is the Bible. Uh, and uh, although it's kind of a condensation of one of the Proverbs that actually says, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Uh, that's Proverbs 16, 18, if you're keeping score at home. Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. You better get that one right. <laughs> better get that one right. May the force be with you. <laughs> hey, I saw that. Someone held up a Jesus bulletin back there. Obi-Wan Kenobi. Let your light shine within you so that it can shine on someone else. Yeah, there's a tricky one, actually. That was Oprah, not Jesus. What Jesus said was, let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. 
One day, the light will shine through and people will understand everything I ever did. Yeah, you think that was Jesus? Actually, Kanye West. <laughs> very different, very different. <laughs> do or do not, there is no try. Yeah, that's Yoda <laughs> from Star Wars. <clears throat> I think the Empire Strikes Back, if I'm not mistaken. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. Jesus, for sure. And not just Jesus, by the way, but in almost every religious tradition, there is a version of this, the golden rule. It's stated in slightly different ways, but it's present in nearly all of them. The best and most beautiful things in the world cannot be touched. They must be felt with the heart. Yeah, that's correct. Not Jesus, but Helen Keller. Dark times lie ahead of us, and there will be a time when we must choose between what is easy and what is right. That's Dumbledore from the Harry Potter series. <laughs> and then the last one. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Yeah, that's right. That's Jesus. And I thought that'd be a fun way for us to think about the red letters <clears throat> in those red letter editions where Jesus is quoted in the Gospels. Uh, and in fact, in, in a few other places as well, those red letters appear, like in 1 Corinthians, for example, um, or in Revelation as well. At the beginning of this year, as we are making new commitments, as we are thinking about the disciplines in which we will engage this year, it's a good way to start the year, to pay attention to what Jesus said, and to think about how we can do a better job of following in Jesus' steps and putting into practice in our lives what Jesus actually said. You know, too often these days, it seems like there is an emphasis on what people should believe about Jesus. And that's great, except when it is to the detriment of what Jesus actually said and what he told us that we ought to do in our lives. Both are important. Orthodoxy, belief, uh, right belief about Jesus, and orthopraxy, putting into practice what Jesus taught us, are both important things. And it seems to me at the beginning of the year when we're making new commitments, when we have the blank pages of the calendar before us and we're thinking about how we're going to live our lives this year, that paying attention to those red letters, to what Jesus taught, uh, is an important thing. Today we're talking about love. When Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? His answer was there are, that there were two, actually. The greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. And he said the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And in the Sermon on the Mount, the fifth chapter of the Sermon on the Mount, we heard the words a moment ago, Jesus talks a little bit more about what it means to love your neighbor. He extends that. He amplifies that. And the way he does that is to say, well, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, that's not in the Hebrew Scriptures, as some of the other verses in this neighborhood of the Sermon on the Mount are quotes from there. Rather, this is kind of the way people generally think. Uh, you love your neighbor and you hate your enemy. <clears throat> it's as though Jesus is saying, well, everybody says that. But I say to you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. And he goes on to say, what good is it if you love those who love you? I mean, everybody does that. What good is it if you greet only those who greet you? Everybody does that. It's no big deal. But you must be complete in your love for others as your heavenly Father is complete. And he explains what he means by that when he says, God sends the rain to fall on the just and the unjust and the sun to shine on good and evil alike impartiality, completeness, and love that makes no distinction for the sun and the rain is shared with everybody. 
and that's how we are to love. That is a tall order, isn't it? It's it's like the child who wrote to his pastor, and he said, I know God says we're supposed to love everybody, but does God know my big sister? (laughs) And, of course, the answer is yes. And there are those times, even within our families, when we might be mad at our brother or sister, we might be upset with mom or dad. And even in those times, we still love, don't we? And then there are times in our lives when we are hurt by someone, when someone doesn't greet us or doesn't speak to us, when someone does not return the love that we express for them, or even say thank you, or perhaps they're even rude to us, that we're still called to love because God loves us in that way, no matter what. That is a difficult thing. And so as we think about that this morning, we think, first of all, about, well, what does it mean when we talk about enemies? I'm thinking that most of us really don't use that word very much, probably. We don't think about enemies. Uh, We do think about it in in the big terms, people who want to do harm uh, to us, terrorists or some other people who want to do harm, people out there that we hear about that do something terrible to others. We can think of them as enemies. Closer to home, sometimes we experience hurt from someone else, abuse from someone else. And we understand in a more direct way that word. Or it can be something as simple as that person that doesn't like us or that person that we have decided is unlovable for whatever reason. It all applies here to this instruction on how we should love. So when we begin to think about that, what what that means for us, the question may be, well, why? I mean, aside from the fact that Jesus commands it, aside from the fact that Jesus tells us that's the way we should love, that we should love uh, in a way that is impartial. We should love everybody. We should not hate anybody. Uh, What does that mean? Well, for one thing, the importance of that is that uh, when we hate another person, hate begets hate. When we take revenge on another person, then that revenge escalates. It grows. When we hate another person, that person has part of us. We are held captive in some way to that other person, and and we're not free. We tend to think that uh, hate is something that just happens. It's like an emotion, but it's really not. And we tend to think that about love, that love is just a feeling that we have, but it's really more than that in the way that Jesus teaches us. Anger is an emotion that comes on very quickly. Resentment is that anger that kind of lingers. That's, that's an emotion. But what do we do with that? We choose to hate or we choose to love. Those are choices. They're difficult choices, but they're choices. The way that Jesus uses the word love, the way that the Apostle Paul uses the word love, the word is agape in the Greek, it means unconditional goodwill toward another. It means never seeking revenge. It means always wanting and working for the best for everyone else. It does not mean necessarily continuing in a relationship with someone that's hurtful. It doesn't mean that. It may be the, that the most loving thing we can do for ourselves and for someone else is to get away from a person that is hurtful. And that's important to know. But it never means that we can take revenge and lash out and hurt another. That is not the way of Christ. And that's a tall order and that's a difficult thing sometimes for us. We we love because Christ first loved us. And when we love 
instead of striking out, then we end a cycle of hate. Dr. Martin Luther King in one of his sermons talks about driving from Atlanta to Chattanooga on a stormy dark night with his brother A.D. And he said for some reason the drivers they were meeting were less than courteous. They, they weren't dimming their lights, many of them. And his brother A.D. finally said, I've had enough of this, and he turned his lights on bright. And Martin Luther King said that he said to his brother, don't do that. You could cause an accident and somebody could get hurt. And then he said, what we need is for somebody to dim the lights, for someone to shine the dim, beautiful lights of love, he said, and break the cycle of hate. And that's what it does when we live according to the teaching of Jesus here. We break the cycles of hate whether that's in the Middle East or whether it's uh, gangs in our urban centers, the cycle of hate can be so, so destructive. And how do we do that? Well, Jesus says, pray for those who persecute you. We pray. And when we pray for the other, then our resentment is hard to hang on to. When we pray for that person that has wronged us, then we begin to remember in our prayers that that is a child of God as well. When we pray for the other person, we are also praying for the strength to do the difficult thing and to love as Jesus has taught us. So, why would Jesus teach this to his disciples? Well, I've mentioned some of the reasons, but one of the main reasons is because we are to be determined who we are and what we do, not by what the other person does, but by Christ. As red-letter Christians, when we strive to be red-letter Christians, what we're doing is we're, we're saying that we're determined by the teaching of Jesus. We're determined by that relationship with Christ. That's what determines who we are and how we will behave. Jesus says, you know, if you love those who love you, well, it's the other person that's determining who you are. And if you greet only the people who greet you, it's the other person that's determined how you're going to behave. But love as God does in a complete way, in an impartial way. And that's a powerful word. It's a transforming word to be determined from within and in our relationship with Christ instead of being determined by everyone else. I was reading recently um, about Wade Boggs. Wade Boggs was a, a Hall of Famer, a third baseman for the Boston Red Sox, and he hated going to Yankee Stadium. He hated going to Yankee Stadium. And it's not just because that was so-called enemy territory. They treated him all right, except for one fan. Now, can you imagine? One fan made him hate going to Yankee Stadium. The fan had a box nearby. You know, it's a more intimate kind of, uh, of venue. And during warm-ups in particular, this one fan would shout obscenities and, and put him down and insult him over and over again while he's trying to warm up. Him personally, targeting him. And so... Finally, one day, he'd had enough, and, and so he walked over, and he said, Hey, are you the guy that uh, keeps yelling at me? And the guy said, Yeah, what are you going to do about it? And so he pulled out a new baseball, and he autographed it, he autographed it and he handed it to this Yankee fan. And, uh, and the guy stopped doing it. It changed him. That one act. It's amazing how there is potential in the way that we love others, determined by our relationship with Jesus, to even change the nature of relationship, to even change the heart of another person. That's the power of love. I want to close with this image, and I want us to take it with us. Martin Luther King, in his letter uh, from Birmingham jail, talked about the early church, and he said the early church was not a thermometer, but a thermostat. He said a thermometer takes a reading of what's going on in the environment, and it reports that, and it, and it changes with the environment. But a, thermo a thermostat uh, 
does pay attention to what's going on in the environment, and it reads what's going on in the environment, but it doesn't just change with the environment. It changes the environment. It leads to changing the environment. And he was challenging his Christian brothers and sisters, especially those in the clergy in the South, to be thermostats, not thermometers. At the beginning of this year, as I think about my own commitments, as I think about my own life, my own relationships, I want to be a thermostat, not a thermometer. I don't want to be just determined by the environment. I want to be somehow aware of the environment but able to affect change. I don't want to just go with the flow and be determined by everyone else. I, I, want, I want to be determined by something else. I want to be a red-letter Christian. And I hope that as you think about your commitments for this year, you will be too. Amen. Dear gracious God, thank you for your deep love toward me, and thank you for sending Jesus on this earth to show me how to love. Lord, I know that I do not warrant your love, and yet you have showered unconditional love and grace toward me through Christ, for which I praise and thank you. But Lord, you desire all your children to love others as Christ loved us. But my love is poor and weak and is far removed by all that you desire of me. Fill me, I pray, with the love of Christ that I may love others in the same way that Christ loved me. So that as your love pours into my soul, so I may be used as a channel for Christ's love to stream out to others with whom I come into contact. Help me to demonstrate your love not only to those who are lovable, but also to those who lash out at me through pain or anger, disappointment or loss. May the love of Jesus be manifested in me, and may the love of Jesus be distributed by grace through faith to all with whom I come in contact. Bless my enemies. Bless them with provisions. Prosper them. Give them insight into how much you love them. I pray that they will find joy and peace in their hearts through discovering your great love. Thank you for hearing my prayer. Thank you for teaching me to walk in your principles. And thank you for changing me from the inside out. Be with us as we pray your prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we Give those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
As our ushers come forward now for the presentation of our tithes and offerings, I simply want to say thank you. Thank you for all the ways that you show love, that you seek to make a difference through your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness. Together, we really can be instruments of God's peace. Amen. Anytime we finish a service here in the sanctuary, we always open the doors of our church to you. If you've been visiting with us, and if today's the day that you would like to become a member, to become part of this faith community, Dr. Brewster and I will be here at the communion rail as we sing our closing hymn, and we would love to welcome you and introduce you to the congregation as we now raise our voices to God.
Well, friends, we're excited to introduce to you the newest members of our congregation. And let's see, as you look from your left to your right, we want to introduce you to Abigail, who is in second grade, I believe, to her mom, Mandy, to Abigail's big brother, Cannon, who is in the sixth grade confirmation class, and to Abigail and Cannon's father, Chris. These are the Hamiltons. We're excited to welcome them to the church and so happy that Michael Dixon is here, who will be their first friend to stay connected with them. Yeah, and as you become a part of this congregation, uh, I ask you, do you reaffirm your faith in Christ? And will you be loyal to the church and uphold it by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? Welcome again uh, to y'all. It's wonderful to have you as part of our congregation. I'm going to ask you to remain up front so that folks can come by and give you a warm First Church welcome at the close of our, our service. And I want to let you know the reason Dr. Lamar Smith is not uh, up here uh, with us this morning is his brother Don passed away on Friday evening. And so he's with his family and the service will be tomorrow in East Texas. So we want to keep Lamar and his family uh, in our prayers. Our gathering will soon be ended. Where will we go and what will we do? May grace, peace, hope, love, and joy forever accompany you. Amen.